call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Dr. Ashley D. Farmer, who is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of History here at Duke University. She's the author of the forthcoming book, What You've Got is a Revolution, Black Women's Movement for Black Power, which will be published by UNC Press. How are you doing today, Ashley? Good, how are Good. you? So talk a little bit about this project. You know, um, when we think about the Black Power Movement, at least as it's been kind of popularly rendered to us, we think about it as a highly masculine space. Mm -hmm. um, we think about it as a movement that prescribed roles for women. Mm -hmm. um, some women willingly fitting into these roles. And, and part of what you're talking about are those women who push back in organizations like Karinga's, Us, and or other types of organizations that were kind of at the forefront of black nationalist politics in the 1960s. Yeah, I mean, conventional narratives contend that black power was too patriarchal in nature and women either had a couple of choices. They either capitulated to the sexism and patriarchy, they went out and formed feminist or women-centered movements outside of the movement. And basically I'm arguing there was a third option, in which women found themselves to be ideological and political adherents to black power. They believed in it as a political movement, but still wanted it to be um, imagined in its most emancipatory form um, in terms of African-American women. And I think that one of the ways to approach this is not looking at them in the organization context but in the ideological context mm -hmm. so as long as we continue to look at an organizational context we're always going to see kind of a men led women followed model but that's not the way I think that they asserted their politics and it's not the way that they always pushed back so instead I look at their speeches their open letters their poetry their pamphlets, their, pamphlets <laughs> their actual yeah. artistic drawings where I see them negotiating what it meant to be a woman mm -hmm. and an adherent of a particular black power ideology so in the case of something like cultural nationalism I see them redefine what they meant to be an African woman. In the case of the Black Panther Party, might be the black revolutionary that's always deemed male, but they're shifting it and calling it um, or identifying it as a female trope or idea as well. And I'm arguing here that these um, tropes or personas that they're developing and pushing are making men need to negotiate the movement. Yeah. And in turn, it's not looking as patriarchal as we thought, also the way women are pushing back as we thought, and it gets us out of this idea that um, men never change their minds or were never influenced by women in the movement. I mean, that's one of the things you suggest that in fact, um, the men in these movements were responsive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to these critiques, to the extent that they could be responsive exactly. and make the imagined safe space. Um, talk a little bit about some of those responses and some of those negotiations on the ground in some of these organizations. Yeah, you know, I want to be clear that I don't think that sexism didn't exist in the movement. It <laughs> certainly gotcha. did. I just don't think it was the defining characteristic of many of these women's experiences or that they didn't find ways to combat it. Um, and one of the ways they do this is for reimagining, reinserting this persona as an African woman or a revolutionary woman. And the key here is they're connecting it to ideology. So they're mm -hmm. saying, if you are a revolutionary nationalist, then you have to believe in the emancipatory properties of women, right? right. If you are a cultural right. nationalist right. Right. and you really believe in this, you've got to believe in how women function in this. And as a result, um, they start to have these conferences and conversations, both internally and externally, where we see men sitting back and saying, hmm, you're right, I can't really posture as a revolutionary or a true adherent, a leader of this <laughs> ideology, and only be applying it to half of the people. Um, a very good example would be somebody like Baraka who originally was a cultural nationalist, moved along the spectrum you know, to Marxism and et cetera. But you see him in the beginning really following a very conservative model. But then you see him kind of negotiate a pushback, particularly with his wife Amina. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you see him go into these study sessions. You see them having these little conferences where he's the keynote speaker. And he stops and says, wait a minute, this is not the way it goes. And as he's re-articulating ideology, one of the things that moves the ideolog ideology along is this idea that we've got to be more inclusive and understanding of women and see them not as you know objects or um, put them on a pedestal, but see them as our revolutionary brethren in that way. When we see the black feminist movement emerge in this moment, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the, the highlight being Kumbahi, mm -hmm. we often read that as almost a direct response to the Absolutely. gender politics and sexual politics of the black nationalist mm -hmm. movement. What is the relationship of the women within these black power organizations to say the more mainline black feminist movement that's emerging in the late 60s and the 1970s? Yeah, I mean, you know, it varies along the spectrum. I think um, some of them find it to be useful in the sense that they'd have no problem with them advocating for women's rights, but mm -hmm. they um, question sort of the liberalist guiding fractures of these um, um, feminist 
feminist groups um, that are not as radical as they would like to be in their critique. Um, and it's also just seemed to be a personal choice. Some women feel that they can combat all of these forms of oppression from within the black power movement. Some feel that they've got to separate out. And then you have groups that kind of ride the middle of the spectrum. One example would be the Third World Women's Alliance, mm -hmm. um, which very much developed out of SNCC in the black power phase of SNCC, but also separated out into a women's group to better address these issues. Um, and while they're doing it, I don't think that they let go of the guiding principles of black power. They just try to apply them more broadly. So um, it seems to be a more generative relationship than antagonistic always. Right? We're here watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Dr. Ashley Farmer, historian, who's the author of the forthcoming book, What You've Got is a Revolution, Black Women's Movement for Black Power, which we published in 2017, Yes. UNC Press. Uh, do you find it ironic that when we think about the gender critiques of the civil rights movement, Black Power era, that many of the cr uh, critiques are lobbied at the Black Power movement, but you could argue there's just as much problematic gender politics within traditional civil rights organizations. Clearly SCLC, but Absolutely. also at SNCC also. Why do you think our narratives naturally go to this black power model for that critique and, and not really given that same amount of substantial critique to the more traditional civil rights movement? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is um, the sound bike of Stokely Carmichael and Prone. Um, <laughs> you know, they kind of keeps being reiterated as an example of black power sexism. Right. I think if you talk to most women in SICK, they would say that you know, it was entirely taken out of context and right. it was a joke. And Stokely was very progressive in terms of thinking about, about women in gender right. roles. Um, but Stokely being the harbinger of black power or the symbol of black power for the popular community, they often relate that. Um, also, I think that there are a lot more examples to point to of really egregious sexism in the public sphere for black um, power. It was seemed to be a little bit more subtle or masked in respectability politics or black church well, politics. Cleaver, I mean, wh yeah, wh exactly. what do you do with Cleaver? Exactly, right? or something like Solon Nice. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I don't think that um, some of the male black power advocates did themselves any favors by asserting it in the, in the realms that they did, but I think you're absolutely right that, you know, there were all these kinds of subtle practices happening in these kinds of institutions and when I, th when I think of the recent work, uh, volume of work, really, mm -hmm. from Peniel Joseph and mm -hmm. a few other folks, um, have you been surprised by this new interest, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the black power era uh, amongst, you know, academics at this right. point in time and the larger public, really? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's an interesting concept. Um, on the one hand, I think that there are certain symbols of black power that have always captured the American imaginary, mm -hmm. the Black Panthers being one of them, Angela Davis being another, yeah. right? Um, but what I think has been really interesting about that is that that kind of initial issues or draw to these f issues has proliferated in a great level of scholarship that really has discovered what uh, kinds of structures, people, mm -hmm. ideas were happening around these major figures. And as a result, is really reintroducing folks to um, the broader swath of the black power movement. You, you mentioned the Black Panther movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Stanley Nelson, of course, yes. has a new documentary. Mm -hmm. um, I think about the Black Power mixtape from a few years mm -hmm. ago. Documentary about Angela Davis mm -hmm. from, from a few years ago. Uh, do you see any real connections between our revisiting that moment to everything that's happening now, particularly around Black Lives Matter? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's some key contexts that come up. I've seen Stanley Nelson's great documentary. Um, you know, one of the things that's coming up is that you know, women were a huge force in mm -hmm. the Black Panther Party, particularly in 69, 70, when a lot of the men were in jail, imprisoned, right. or being killed by police, right, and the law enforcement. Um, and I see that same thing happening with the Black Lives Matter movement as well. I mean, also, the, the Panthers, one of the great things that they did is that they married this kind of straight ideological points of what we need now mm -hmm. with a larger critique of the system. And I see the Black Lives Matter movement also trying to do that, saying, you know, this is our current critique of police brutality, but we can't end that there. Right. We've got to, this is symptomatic of segregation, of voting rights repeals, of, you know, issues of modernization, of, you know, militarization of police forces in a way that is problematic for everyone. So I think it's um, a lot of repeating, but also um, they're using some of the best elements of black power and moving forward with this. Who are the real heroes, if you will, um, of this moment of black women within these black nationalist movements really pushing the envelope and pushing these organizations into the future. Because part of what you said earlier, right, you know, beyond kind of the organizational structures, the idea that where they really weighed in was 
in ideology, mm -hmm. right? It's really about imagining mm -hmm. what a future is for black folks as opposed mm -hmm. to actually having to deal with the realities of the day-to-day -day within these organizations. Yeah. Um, so who are the real folks, you know, real women who are really pushing the envelope in this one? Yeah, I mean, there's some great theorists that come out um, that some of the people have heard of, some that have never have heard of. Um, I think somebody like Tarika Lewis, who's one of the mm -hmm. first members of the Black Panther Party as a woman, you know, she's known for being organizationally that woman, but she has a large body of drawing you know, um, about the revolutionary figure from 67 to 69 um, that kind of gets swept under the rug for Emory's art. And Emory's art was extremely influential. Right, right. But through that art, she's also trying to imagine a different understanding right. of the revolutionary figure. Um, somebody like Amina Baraka, I mean, Baraka is a huge, huge person um, and a force to be reckoned with. But he himself, even in, say, autobiographical accounts, credits Amina yeah. with really forwarding and, you know, pushing his thinking in that way. Um, and she was key um, in his Congress of African people of really setting up a women's division that did more than just the cooking and the cleaning, yeah, but yeah. really was a space for ideological development and intense study about how do we marry these ideas about Pan-Africanism with what it means to be a woman and with, with what it means to be a revolutionary. When you think about the Black Lives Matter moment, um, and I, I've often described when we see folks on the ground, you know, these are the grandchildren mm -hmm. of Baldwin, uh, Baird Rustin, and, and Audre Lorde. Mm -hmm. um, have you been surprised by how progressive the leadership looks, mm. you know, in terms of young folks on the ground? Um, you know, I think that it's always that way. I think we have a really big problem in society of thinking that, lead, that social movements are male, um, they're <laughs> middle class, um, they're straight, and, you know, and, and, that, and we have a really hard time conceptualizing a movement outside of that, such to the fact that we often name these, mooders, these movements leaderless, right. when in <laughs> fact it's just that the people that don't look like the people you know or have been kind of mythologized as the people you know are on the ground moving and shaking. So I think that's one of the great things about social media um, that has brought these kind of movements forth and these leaders forth without needing these um, organizational backings um, that lead us into who can carry this kind of messiah figure. Yeah. So I think they've always been there. Yeah. yeah. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Dr. Ashley Farmer, who is a postdoctoral associate in the history department here at Duke University. Um, you know, this is going to seem like bad form to ask this next question, <laughs> you know, particularly as you're finishing one book. Um, but what's next for you? What, what are the projects that you're hoping to get into after you're done with Black Women of the Black Power Era? Yeah, you know, I am um, very interested in developing a body of work that takes um, Black women radicals seriously as intellectuals mm -hmm. and ideologues. Um, mm -hmm. There's a copious amount of work and writing and thinking and theorizing that they're doing that I think is overlooked in large part because it doesn't look like what we think it should look mm -hmm. like or wasn't given the outlets that men were had. Um, so I might go the way of you know focusing on woman, one woman, a biography, someone mm -hmm. um, of some of these activists. Um, another opportunity would be to focus on one of these organizations more in depth. But really interested in looking at how they're writing and thinking about being both radicals and women and how, um, what ideologies attract them, yeah. um, in which they find emancipatory possibility as women. What and are you reading these days? Um, I am reading Paul Vade's The Sellout right now, <laughs> um, which I think is amazing and fabulous. Um, and I just have so much respect for anybody that can write great satire. Yeah. Um, so that's on my shelf right now. Um, I'm also really revisiting Alice Walker right now. I'm having, um, I've read a lot of her books when I was younger, um, but I'm finding um, that her novels especially have been really useful when thinking about how to write about these women in a way that is mm -hmm. more true, um, mm -hmm. not just to historical facts, but their lived experiences. And I find her to be very inspirational in that respect. We've been joined today by Dr. Ashley Farmer, who's the author of the four forthcoming what You've Got is a Revolution, Black Women's Movements for Black Power, which will be published in 2017 by UNC Press. She's currently a postdoctoral associate in the Department of History at Duke University. Thanks for joining us Yes, today, thank Ashley. you for having me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back. Black, 